So, hello everybody. Um, I'm here because optimizing Go code is fun. And also because I think this image is just great. But the first question you should be asking yourselves is, is your program actually slow? By which we mean, do you think it could go faster? And that's a sonic reference. And lastly, is it worth optimizing? Because it's a trade-off between time invested and other things like simplicity, like Dave explained. So enter a silly example. And everybody can see the mouse there, right? Uh, ah, whatever. Just hide it. So we've got a function that takes um, a list of strings, a slice of strings, and you want to copy it. So the simplest uh, implementation you can think of is just uh, creating, a, creating a new, defining a new list, and then just appending to that list all the previous elements, and then you're done. You just return that, right? And we can write a simple benchmark for that, and writing a benchmark in Go is as simple as writing a function like this. You just, um, for n times, you just run that function with some input, and you also want to report the allocations um, for, for it. So if we do go test bench equals dot, we get uh, some data from that. So you can see that the function runs with this input at about five microseconds per run, and allocate about 10 times, which makes sense. And we can use uh, pprof, which is going to tell us where the CPU time is mostly being spent on. And in this case, perhaps obviously, the append line is what's using most of your CPU time. So we can rewrite that function to insert, insert pre-allocate the whole list, because we know that in advance, and then just assign each of the elements without using append, because append is a little bit more inefficient. So that's about 70% faster, and only allocates once, because of um, what I just explained. And this uses a tool called BenchComp, which does the obvious thing, which is to take the old versus the new numbers and just give you simple statistics, right? So we're done, right? That's, uh, that's it. And so I know somebody else did the joke here, but you know, I didn't know that, so. But hang on, this is a silly example, right? Enter a JSON benchmark. How many of you are familiar with JSON? Raise hands, okay, cool. How many of you are happy with how JSON works in Go? Okay. So JSON, the, the JSON package has a, a benchmark called Code Decoder, which decodes about one megabyte of JSON data. And if you run this benchmark, you can see that it only runs 100 times in one second. It takes about 10 milliseconds per run. It allocates a lot, and it's not very fast. It runs at about 200 megabytes per second, which is not very fast. So this benchmark is slow. But most importantly, it is not going to stay still. So if we run this benchmark over and over again, uh, without actually uh, changing the code or the input at all, uh, you're going to see that the numbers jump up and down by as much as 3 4%. And this is a problem because recent JSON speedups have been as small as 1.3%. So how can you possibly measure um, progress or measure whether or not you're doing anything well or not if the, jumper, if the numbers jump up and down so much, right? So we've got too much noise. How, well, that's just what I said. Um, so the answer to that is math, or rather statistics. So you want to get multiple samples, and with that you can measure variance. Instead of using BenchComp, we're going to use BenchStat, and I know that's confusing naming, but just ignore BenchComp exists, just delete it from your hard drive. And if we run the benchmark eight times, and then feed that data into BenchStat, it's going to tell us that your benchmark runs at about 10.1 milliseconds on average, and then we're with a variance of plus minus 3%. But we still need less noise. Plus minus 3% is not good enough if some of the improvements we've seen have been as small as 1%. The first question we should ask is, is the machine idle? Now, when I work in Go code, I tend to have a couple of separate browsers, each one of them with a couple of slacks, slack tabs, and then editors, music, email, and so on. And this is a problem because my CPU usage sits at between 0 and 15%, even though supposedly I'm not doing anything. And this JSON benchmark depends 100% of all of my cores because it's a parallel benchmark, and JSON uses your CPU because it's JSON. And, and here's, here's a fun example. Uh, in Slack, you can, have, um, you can have animated emojis, right? And on the Gopher Slack, you have a badger, a dancing badger. I don't know if any of you get the reference. <laughs> 
but the but the problem here is that Slack is a JavaScript app, so it animates those little dancing badgers with JavaScript. So each one of them uses about two percent of CP, two percent CPU on my machine. So if somebody like Paul Jolly, a friend of mine, sends me 50 badgers, I'm just going to send my laptop burning and not doing anything useful. So close resource-hungry apps, wink, wink, Slack, but also others. And CPU usage should now be at a between 0 to 4%, should be at a few percent, uh, even on the spikes. So if you rerun this benchmark eight times, you should, you should see a variance of 1% or so. And we can work with 1%, but the problem now uh, is that the CPU burns. So if we run the benchmark 20 times, we're, you're going to see that after, for example, on my laptop, after nine or so, it gets much slower. Now, why is that? The answer is that laptops throttle, and I've got some evidence to, to prove that, scientific evidence. So that's, that's my laptop, not the one you can see here, but the one I've got back in my bag. And you can see that the, these little holes at the bottom, they're the air vents. That's where the heat escapes um, through. And you can see they're really tiny, like they measure about two gopher feet, and that's my blue gopher. Like, go for first scale, right? Um, and this laptop can go quite fast. It's got four real cores that go at 3.4 gigahertz um, on turbo speeds. Now, the, the result is that when I used to benchmark Go code, my lab would just catch fire with the laptop uh, trying to run that fast. And it would sometimes even power off because it got too hot. So we cannot use turbo speeds to benchmark because most laptops these days, especially the thin ones, cannot keep up with that. So we've got a tool for that, and that's kind of the theme of this, of this talk. The tool is called Perflock, and you can guess what it does. It locks a certain performance for a process. So you can tell it, Perflock run, uh, run as a daemon, you leave it running, and then say Perflock, for example, run this process, which is go test bench, at 70% CPU power. And what this is gonna do is run the process at 70% CPU clock speed. So in this case, it's slower, because it's not reaching the full turbo speed, but I can run it over 20 times, and the laptop does heat up, but it never throttles, because it's already consistently throttled, if that makes sense. There is a small caveat. This only runs for Linux, but the idea is pretty simple, and most modern operating systems these days have kind of the same thing, so it should be portable to Mac and Windows if anybody wants to work on that. Now, what we said before about the numbers jumping up and down so much, even if we don't touch the code at all, if we try to do the same with eight runs before and after and bench that, even if the average runtime in this case um, decreases by a tenth of a millisecond, even if that happens, because the variance is so high, well, 1%, uh, bench stat with its statistics and math black magic is able to tell us most likely nothing actually happened here. And that's correct, nothing actually happened. I've skimmed over some details, such as what count to use or what's a p-value. I'm not going to try to define these math terms or try to define the theory because I only, I only took a couple of classes in math and statistics at university and that was a long time ago and I slept through most of them. So instead, we're going to see some, um, we're going to go through some examples. So the idea is that if you've got a lot of variance and you're not getting any data of, out of that, you need to use higher counts. And to help you see that, imagine that you have these little gophers as data points, and the y-axis is how fast your benchmark is. Um, and then on the left, you measured three points, you made some change, and then on the right, you've got another three data points, right? Now, it's kind of difficult to see whether or not anything actually improved, because if, if only one of the points on the left moved down by a little bit because you got luckier or less unlucky, then maybe the data would look completely different, right? But if you've got 10 data points, you can kind of, as a human, you can visually see it's very unlikely that I got lucky five times in a row, right? So you can sort of see two clusters of, a cluster of gophers on the left up there and a cluster of gophers a little bit further down on the right. So that's basically what a p-value does. A p-value tells you, statistically, it's unlikely that this is just pure chance. Probably you did something uh, well. But there's a gotcha. You shouldn't be searching for p-values. So if you, and this is called the multiple testing problem. And the idea is that when we, what we saw before about getting multiple results with BenchComp and, and comparing them against the previous one without actually changing the code at all, if we try to do the same with BenchStat, like I explained, most of the time, even if the actual averages change, it's still going to tell you most likely nothing happened. 
But this is statistics. So about 5% of the time, if you keep running it over and over again, at, at some point it is going to tell you, hey, I found something that's statistically significant. But that's just pure chance, because statistics work like that. So the, the gist of the idea here is that if the data looks bad, don't get new data, because you're just going to you're, you're gonna randomly stumble upon some data that looks good or looks bad, but it might just, it's probably just um, noise. And there's an excasity about this. I realize most of you cannot read that, but the idea is that uh, a company got some scientists to try to find the link between different colors of jelly beans and acne. And they ran the test so many times that one of them actually gave a positive, um, the one between green jelly beans and acne. And they published that. And they say, they say green jelly beans linked to acne, 95% confidence, only 5% chance of coincidence. And it is a coincidence, because if you run the test enough times, you're going to run into coincidences, right? And that's the, the idea. A small side note before we go on uh, with bottlenecks. Some tools that I spoke about, like PPROF and PERFLOC, they, they, are, they work well with CPU workloads, but statistics, and in this case, bench stat, they work for all benchmarks, even if your benchmark measures network latency, or if it measures disk, or if it measures anything else. So to recap, you should be using bench stat to compare statistics and get good data from that, and PERFLOC to avoid, to avoid noise when your laptop heats up too much. And these slides are going to be available later, so don't worry too much about taking notes. Now we get to the fun part, and that's compiler tricks. Now, I realize I'm going to go a little bit fast, so if you don't follow some of those, don't worry about it. You can just follow along with the slides later on your own time. The first one, some of you might have seen. You can ask the compiler which functions it is not in lining because they are too complex. So function in lining, I assume most of you are familiar with that. It's Instead of when you make a, a call to a function, um, there's a, a tiny bit of, of overhead in that. So the compiler, in some cases, will try to just inline that code into the, to, into the caller function, right? Now, it should only do that if the, func if the function is small enough. Because, because if the function you're calling is too big, then your binary might, be, might get 10 times bigger or 10 times slower. So it has a heuristic to tell, is the function that I'm calling small enough? And in this case, it uses a budget. So you can ask it that exactly, and it can tell you, for example, in the I.O. package, I did not inline a call to copy buffer because it, I measured its cost to be 84, and the limit is 80. So in this case, if that call was in a hot path, for example, in a hot loop, and you want to make that faster, you might try to fiddle with the code a little bit to see if you can please the uh, compiler and make it do that. You can also ask it when expressions escape to the heap. And uh, I know somebody gave a talk on stack and heap earlier, so I'm going to assume that most of you are up to speed. So basically, when something escapes to the heap, it means that the compiler has to put that on the heap instead of the stack. And that has its own GC overhead and so on. You can also ask it when it's inserting bounce checks. Um, yes. So in this case, for example, in the I.O. package, it found that in one file, it was checking if an index was within bounds of a slice. And that, that's sometimes necessary, because otherwise, if you indexed outside of the bounds, then the, the code has to panic, right? So what panics is the bounce check. But sometimes the code is simple enough that the compiler can figure out, oh, I don't need a bounce check, because I can, I can prove that the index is going to be within bounds statically. And that's kind of... That's one of the things that the proof pass does, and that's where the name comes from. And it can tell you, for example, in the I.O. package, I proved that these two bounce checks are not necessary, so they're being deleted. And if you enable a higher debug level, it's going to tell you lower level information that might be useful to you. Now, there's a small gotcha that might be interesting. Uh, and that's when code suddenly gets slower or faster, and you cannot tell why. And here's a commit from 2011 from Ross Cox. He made a change to the JSON package. So some benchmarks got faster. But this particular benchmark, benchmark skip value, shouldn't get faster because the code that it runs wasn't touched. But it got like 25% faster. And he says, I cannot explain why benchmark skip value gets faster. Maybe it is one of those code alignment things. And the point here is that modern computers are complicated. And sometimes they will do things. and. Unless you're a hardware engineer, sometimes you just have to give up and say, oh, it's just how it works. 
And code alignment, I'm going to try to explain a little bit. The idea is that when you compile a binary, the, the actual binary code gets laid out in a binary file, in an executable file, right? So if you, if you change code that's up here, and then that gets shorter or uh, it gets smaller or bigger, then it might move around code further down, even if the code further down hasn't been touched or modified. But then computers do things like uh, have three, they have three levels of caches, right? So moving code around might actually make it faster or slower because, or slower because of alignment on those things. Now, I know this is kind of like a um, silly explanation, but you get, you get the idea. Sometimes you just have to give up. But I've got good news, and that's the compiler is getting better. Here's an example. It used to be that the best way to empty a map was to just replace it with a new one. And that worked fine and was fast, but you would just throw away the old map and all the memory that it had allocated, and you would just allocate an entirely new one. And if you went and ranged over the elements and deleted them, that was slow, because ranging over all the elements one by one is slow. But since Go 111, if you write that loop, it's going to compile it it's going to be smart enough to compile it into a single function call that actually does that efficiently because the runtime has access to information that you don't. So now you can do the thing that's intuitive, fast, and doesn't reallocate uh, more space. And something similar happened with counting the number of runes in a string. It used to be that without using the standard library, the fastest way to do this was to actually iterate over the string and just count as you go run by, rune by rune, character by character. And if you did the length of the rune slice of the string, it would copy the string, because strings are read-only, but slices are not, right? But since Go 111, if you do that, the compiler, again, is smart enough to realize, oh, you're just getting the length, so I don't need to copy all the data. So it does basically the same thing as the first piece of code, but it's simpler to understand. So you should give the compiler a chance. And if you think it could do better, you should file a bug, so that it can actually get better. And if you do that, we use the performance label on the issue tracker. And you can also use that label to try to find other similar issues. And if you want to go deeper, and this is getting a little bit more complex, you can use go SSA func, and that takes a pattern. And then when you build a package, for example, if I build a, a file that has a hello world function, and then I say go SSA func equals hello world go build, it's going to dump an SSA file, an SSA HTML file, and that's going to have a lot of content, but it's basically going to begin at how the compiler um, interpreted that code initially, and it's going to end at the um, assembly, at, at the native assembly that it ended up compiling into. So you can see all the steps that the compiler went through, such as optimizations, such as the SSA and so on, and you can try to pinpoint where the compiler did something well or wrong. There's a couple of readmes also that you can read if you want to learn more about all this stuff. They're introductory, but they're also, they also point at more information if you want to go deeper. And that's it. The point that I want you to take away from this talk is that optimizing is good and it's fun, but you should reason about it, and when you do decide to optimize, you should use the right tools. Thank you. So the first question is, why do we benchmark on a laptop, though? Shouldn't there be a better environment to do so? And that is correct, but I am not made of money. So um, in a perfect world, I would have a rack at home with a, with a computer that never changes CPU frequency and that's super well ventilated. So it always runs at the same CPU frequency. And it, it wouldn't even, um, it would just run Linux with nothing else and then my process, right? So that then the noise would be minimal. But that would be expensive, and I, to be honest, I don't want to deal with that. It's, and for example, you, you also add issues like, oh, what if I'm on a plane? Then how do I benchmark? Do, do you just not benchmark? Uh, you could also pay for a cloud machine to do that, but again, those are expensive. And to me, uh, using tools like Perflock and Benchstat, they give you 90% of what you need, especially in the simpler cases, and you can just use your laptop. And everybody has a laptop, so I, I think that's kind of the point. Uh, somebody asked, isn't this the same talk that you gave at .go? Yes. <laughs> Thank you.